Hey everybody, it's Dustin Meyer, and I realized that from my video yesterday, <laughs> I really need to apologize for just how confuddled everything was. Confuddled, is that even a word? Anyways, so we're going to go over the different settings that I used for my flashes again. And just in case any of you guys missed the previous video where I showed, you know, all the different stuff that I use here in the studio, the setup that I used for the headshot session that I did for myself uh, last week, I'm going to go ahead and go over the different you know, modifiers, flashes, setup, you know, all that stuff so that you guys can get a much better idea as far as the reason why I was able to get the picture that I did. So uh, just to recap, uh, you'll notice that in the background I am using a white paper backdrop instead of like a muslin backdrop that some of you guys might use. <clears throat> and you guys can use whatever you feel like. The reason why I switched to paper is because, and I think that one's like a 10 foot wide one. Anyways, the reason why uh, I decided to go with paper is because no matter how many times I washed, you know, my backdrops, uh, no matter what setting I used in the dryer, they always came out wrinkled. And I don't have a steam machine in my studio, which I probably should. So if you guys have one that you recommend, please let me know in the comments. Uh, anyways, so the reason why I use the paper is obviously it's nice and smooth. I just use the standard bright white. Uh, the other reason too is that over time, you know, they're going to get dirty if you have them all the way down to the floor. So it's just super easy for me to just take a pair of scissors and just cut off the excess that needs to get thrown away. The other thing that you might notice too is that not only do I uh, have the white paper backdrop down, but I actually bring it out about uh, four or five feet or so from the bottom. That way I get a nice white seamless backdrop. So until the day I decide to install one of those, you know, permanent white backdrops, you know, seamless backdrops, I'm, I'm just going to go with paper. So anyways, if you guys are thinking about doing something like this, I highly recommend it. If you're in Austin, I just picked mine up over from Precision Camera. They've got all different kinds of colors. I just use white. Uh, I may go ahead and pick up a gray one just for the heck of it. But anyways, uh, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to change angles and show you guys the actual different lights that I use and also the settings that I use because in the last video it was a little bit of confusion because the camera settings that I was using to shoot the video affected <laughs> the uh, settings on the flashes. So with that being said, oh and before I forget again you guys might be asking what camera do I use and in the studio I just use a Nikon D810 and also, um, <clears throat> excuse me, I use a, a 24 to 70 lens. Now in the headshot, you'll notice in the next section in part two, where we actually go in and I'll show you the different Lightroom uh, adjustments that I make to the, uh, the picture. The photo was taken at ISO 64, which I prefer to use something along those lines in my studio. The reason being is I'm not using mono lights or constant lights in my studio when I use my flashes. So it just helps for me to have my overhead lights on. That way my camera can focus much better. Uh, and the reason why I use ISO 64 is because it won't really bring in any ambient lights. So ISO 64, I use F8 because that way I get the sharpest picture possible and still have some of the background blurred out. Um, I don't try to go any higher than F8 and the reason being obviously because my flashes would just lose all their power and just pew, take forever to recycle. So, and then at 1 1 60th of a second because that's you know, just a comfortable shutter speed for me when it comes to syncing that to my flashes. I know that some flashes will sync at a much higher speed, but for me, really, I just, you know, 1 60th is good for me. So let's take a look at the lighting setup that I use and we'll just go from there. Okay, so this big mamma jamma here is a seven foot Westcott parabolic with a silver lining on the inside. Uh, you may notice that it's pretty much touching the ceiling. Um, the reason why I like to go with something this big is it just creates a really nice wraparound light. And, you know, if you're going for something that almost has kind of a window light effect, this is a really good size to do that. Um, you may want to go with more of the solid white interior, the, uh, which I actually do have one of those. It's a smaller one. It's a five foot. And the cool thing about those is they're, uh, they're black on the outside, white on the inside 
side uh, and you can set it up just like this. However, you can also take the black uh, covering on the outside and use it as a shoot through umbrella, which somebody, you know, some people like that too. So um, I usually, if, if I'm not using this guy, I obviously can raise it up a little bit higher, but my rule of thumb is wherever the actual, uh, you know, the light is coming from, you know, the flashes themselves, I try to have these right at about eye level with my subject. Unless I want to create more of like a you know, overhead kind of coming down sort of light, then I'll raise it up higher and then kind of tilt the light source down. But again, obviously there's not much I can do with this one because it's so big. However, again, it creates that nice wraparound kind of effect. Now I know that there's a couple of different types of parabolics. Uh, there's the more, you know, the deeper one. Uh, and then they have the ones that are more shallow, kind of like your standard, you know, umbrella depth. Um, so yeah, so let's move on. I'm going to show you what the settings are for the flashes. Okay, so moving on to the flashes themselves, I know that yesterday there was some confusion, but I think I actually had the settings correct. It's just normally it's a little bit different uh, when I'm using one strobe. Now, if you notice, I am using the, uh, the Photix Strato TTL wireless receivers. I also have the transmitter on top of my camera. I've got three of these little guys and I also use one on the backlight. These are great for people who want to use speed lights that don't have the built-in uh, radio uh, transmission or receiver option. I know that uh, you know newer versions have that but uh, I'm using the Nikon SB910s. I've had those for about six years or so. I love them mainly because uh, they have a really wide zoom range on the flash head and also they have a built-in temperature gauge so if they start to get too hot from rapid succession firing then it will actually delay the flash to help them cool down especially if you're using like Energizer Lithiums double A's and stuff. The other thing you might be wondering is why don't I have like a power pack hanging off of these guys. Um, one is, well, the biggest reason really is I can use those Energizer lithium batteries uh, inside each flash. And I kid you not, those flashes, if I'm setting it to a higher ISO and, you know, around F5.6, so ISO maybe 800 or 400, and I'm at like a wedding reception or something like that, and I zoom the flash heads all the way into 200, that light will go all the way across the dance floor. I usually have them kind of in a crisscross sort of uh, uh, formation or so. And then on top of that, again, I've got my transmitter and these will go all night. And usually I don't use flash until it gets dark when I'm shooting a wedding. Uh, but anyways, so the SB910s, I actually, I don't know if your flashes have this, but these guys have a, uh, a little kind of like plastic flimsy wide angle diffuser. I go ahead and actually bring those out. And the reason why is because I want these to be as uh, wide angle as possible. So right now with the little flap pulled out, it's at 14 millimeter. And I've got these set to one quarter power manual. The reason why I shoot manual is I want it to be a consistent light. I don't use TTL in the studio. I used to do that a long time ago and I found that I was constantly adjusting photos like exposure and stuff in Lightroom later on. So this makes it a heck of a lot easier for me. So keep in mind, I'm shooting, or the headshot I did uh, the other day was uh, F8 ISO 64 at 1 1 60th of a second. White balance was at uh, daylight. Daylight, I just use that because that's what uh, camera sensors are calibrated for. So I've got two of these guys. Uh, the distance on the back says 2.7, but since I've got two of them, you just double that. So it's about five feet or so. And the distance between the actual light stand and where I was standing is a little bit around, oh, I would say somewhere around that distance, about five feet, maybe a little bit less, you know, four or so. And that gave me a really nice, uh, what I call the ant hill or the bell curve histogram, which I always check on the back of my camera. So it's just a nice, easy hill right between the two ends of your histogram where you've got the shadows on one side, highlights on the other. And that's really what you're going for. That might be the other reason why I use a white backdrop. So I also used a backlight and I'm going to show you guys what I used for that. So you can kind of get a sense of the whole setup.
Okay, so the backlight that I use is a little bit different. Uh, what I've got here, first of all, it's set to one half manual mode and it's about seven feet or so, somewhere between six and seven. The reason why I've got it set to half is one, it's still not as bright as the backlight. The other reason that I do it is I actually have, oh, by the way, this is what's called a Westcott Rapid Box. It's a 24, 25 inch. And on top of that, I've got, uh, which by the way, if you don't have one of these, you should check them out because they're, well, they set up really quickly. Um, now, I don't know if you guys can see this. Again, the inside is silver. Uh, it also comes with a metal dish that you can screw into the front so it acts like a beauty dish, um, you know, whether you decide to use this guy or if you want to go a little bit hotter. The other thing, too, I don't know if you can see this, but you know those plastic diffusers that come with your flash that fit right on the top? I've actually got one of those on the flash head up here as well. And the reason why I do that instead of having the dish is I did some research and I found that... Um, it, uh, it creates a much more even light. Even with this guy in the back, if the dish is in the front, you get a little bit more of a halo and a slightly darker spot in the middle. Uh, but if you're gonna be using this as a main light, especially, I recommend uh, having the diffuser little plastic guy on the head of your flash, which I believe drops it down to about 10 millimeter or so, which is another reason why I have this one up to about half power. And then, taking that dish off because the light that hits the front of the uh, diffuser uh, completely covers the entire front. So I use this as a hair light. I had it much higher up as you saw and pointed downwards. Uh, I wanted to have the edge, the bottom edge of here, right about level with the top of my head. And then of course pointing directly uh, opposite of where my big parabolic is. So that way we get light coming from both sides, but just a little bit behind. The other nice thing too is that with the amount of power that came out of this guy, I had just a little bit of wrap around on the shadow side as well, but also that hair light. So again, the, um, the distance between this guy and where I was standing is somewhere between about six and seven feet. And then of course with the parabolic, uh, despite the fact that they're set a little bit lower, but there's two of them, so it doubles that, that one's about four feet or so. So there you have it. That's the setup that I used for my headshot session the other day. Uh, next, it, well, in the next episode, we're going to just dive right in and I'm going to show you guys what I did to the image in Lightroom. And then in the third step, we're going to go into Portrait Pro and I'll show you any of the retouching that I did. Why did I say any? I mean, yeah, there was retouching done, of course. And then after that, any little last minute stuff that I did in Photoshop. So anyways, apologize for the last video. I am going to leave it up anyway in case I did get some of it right, <laughs> but chances are I probably didn't. However, so consider this part one, and thank you guys so much for watching. If you've got questions, again, I always encourage that you put them down in the comments below. If you've got suggestions on ways that you like to light your studio, please, again, say so, and we can share all that information with each other. Uh, just a last note, I please don't feel like this is the only way to light a headshot session. This is just how I prefer to do it. Everybody's got their own preferences. Everybody has what works for them. So please, this is not the authority on it. This is just what I like to do. So anyways, if you learned something today, please hit that like button. If you want to see more videos that I put out, make sure to hit that subscribe button and that little bell icon. If you don't know exactly what that is, click on that and you'll get notifications for when the next video rolls out. So again, thank you guys so much for watching. My name is Dustin Meyer and I will see you in the next video.